There are only three constant things in my life. Perpetual disappointment, loneliness, and the eternal penfort de deux that Paradox Interactive inflicts upon me as they sup on my rapidly draining life essence. But because Crusader Kings 3 was announced a while ago and is no longer topical, I want to talk about Crusader Kings 2. CK2 is an open world grand strategy Swedish role playing game, or Orcs RPG for short, with an almost fully explorable map of over 61 million square kilometres, dwarfing most other maps in video game history. The game is intimidatingly hard to get into, but also reasonably easy to get competent at if people get through their first few fairly overwhelming hours. But this video is no review, nay my friends, today we are going to explore the genetics. Or more specifically, we'll be ascribing genetics to the logic the game uses to simulate genetic inheritance. An important note here, there's probably a bit of genetics jargon in this video, so I'll throw up definitions of some words on screen when I use them for the first time. Now, if we look at a character page, we can see just masses of information, all of which is irrelevant to us, except for three bits, which we could describe as having some inheritable characteristic. Can you see the three inheritable characteristics? Well, there are two-ish types of traits that we care about, found along here, and the portrait. These are genetic traits, that are mostly genetic most of the time, and syphilis, or the great pox, which is inheritable too. And obviously we know it's simulating infection of the offspring rather than a genetic inheritance, but the game treats it in the same way as a genetic trait, so in the canon CK2 universe it is genetic, and can be transferred by some sort of genetically specific and pathogenic horizontal gene transfer between individuals, which is... interesting. And personality traits. And then of course, how our friend looks! Ah! We're going to be ignoring point two because it requires an examination of epigenetics and inherited environmental factors, which is a video all on itself. Similarly, point three will also be ignored because it would make an already excessive and unnecessary and unwieldy video into a feature length film, and it requires so much work to make any robust inferences and my dainty mind simply can't handle hard work. So the genetic traits are obvious, it is in the name after all. There is a percentage chance for an offspring of a character with a trait to also receive that trait at birth. But sometimes they can develop during childhood, independent of parents' genetic traits, doesn't matter. Additionally, they have a low percentage chance to randomly appear in a newborn from parents who do not have the trait. And we can imagine that the traits spawning in this way are some sort of simplified mutation simulation that occurs only in the positive direction at a predictable rate at a specific gene to create a specific allele or new allele that is functionally indistinguishable from any other same trait allele. Whew. And we can expand this allelic thinking because many CK2 traits have mutually exclusive counterparts or opposites that can't occur together. And we can imagine that these genetic traits can be alleles of each other. From this, we can see CK2 characters have at least 11 genes, including syphilis, which can result in traits, plus some sex signifier which is unlikely to be genic in the same way as the traits, but is presumably determined in each CK2 character's genome. Also, each trait is less common than not having the trait, so a wild-type CK2 character has no genetic traits, so we can arbitrarily draw the CK2 genome like this. These genetic traits can change across a character's lifetime, replacing one with another, and in turn becoming inheritable. Meaning there appears to be none of the genetic interactions we might expect from pairs of chromosomes found in eukaryotes. Or it means that when a trait changes in this manner, both copies of the gene are replaced, either simultaneously or through some weird temporal dominance phenomenon, possibly from physical protein interactions in some quaternary structure, as an example. So. Any somatic mutation simultaneously occurs in the germline. The interchangeable and replaceable feature means either both copies of the gene are replaced either simultaneously with the trait change or through temporal dominance, meaning two of the same mutation needs to occur across the two copies of the gene and the trait only changes after the second copy is changed, or CK2 characters do not have pairs of chromosomes or have only one chromosome and are likely not eukaryotes. 
Also, these Crusader Kings being giant single-cell prokaryotes would explain the mutations being heritable, as there is no germline in prokaryotes, and would explain the horizontal gene transfer of the syphilis gene again. All very interesting. But we don't have anything conclusive yet, and sexual reproduction is definitely happening. Perhaps some unknown process is occurring in the background. So genetic traits are modelled kind of weirdly. The game performs sequential checks on the parents, starting with the father, of any newborn to determine if genetic traits are inherited. Here are all those genetic traits and their inheritance chance stolen from the CK2 wiki. We can see there's between a 5% and a 25% chance of inheriting any of these traits. And for the majority of these traits, if both parents have the trait, the way the new chance is calculated is through those sequential checks. So there is, for example with the genius trait, a 15% chance twice, meaning 1 minus 0.85 squared chance of success, or 27.75% chance of inheritance if both parents are geniuses. Looking at this table, we can see something rather interesting. Some so-called opposite traits do not have the same inheritance chance, and we'll touch on that eventually, but I want to start by looking at the most genetically applicable trait here, the dwarf trait. In the real world, many people with short stature have a genetic disorder called achondroplasia, and I think it's fair to say that the dwarf trait in CK2 is effectively this disorder. We can see that the game models the dwarf trait differently from most other heritable traits. The chance of inheritance goes to 50% if both parents have the trait, whereas if it was checked in the same sequential manner as the other genetic traits, it would be 43.75%. What on earth does this mean? Well, I think it's an attempt to recognise the autosomal dominant inheritance of a missense point mutation in the fibroblast growth factor receptor 3 gene. However, it doesn't actually do that, for two reasons. Now we have the glorious chance to whip out the old Punnett square and do some Mendelian genetics! So here we have two parents who are heterozygous at the FGFR3 gene, where big A is the achondroplasia causing mutation. The first problem with this modelling of an autosomal dominant trait is that the offspring from heterozygous parents who both have that autosomal dominant trait have a 75% chance of inheriting the trait. And if one parent is homozygous, that chance goes up to 100%. And obviously, if both parents are homozygous for the dominant mutation, it's 100% too. The second problem is that this mutation is actually recessive lethal. So this modified first Punnett square accurately models a chondroplasia, whereby two out of three offspring from two people with a chondroplasia will also have a chondroplasia, because we don't count the bottom right, non-viable square. But this disparity between the genetics of achondroplasia and the genetics of the dwarf trait could be where the other people with short stature come in, and the CK2 developers thought long and hard about idiopathic growth hormone deficiencies in the collection of non-FGFR3 mutations that can result in dwarfism and realised, wait a second, this is a ridiculous waste of time! And all of our time will continue to be wasted when we look at the other traits. Now with all the remaining traits we find a bit of a problem with our approach so far. None are simple Mendelian traits in reality, and, for example, the attractive and ugly traits are a subjective collection of a whole bunch of features in the real world. But we're not in the real world, so maybe we can still figure this all out. And of course, the inbred trait, which has an entirely different set of parameters, which we'll briefly touch on eventually. First, we can group all the traits that have the same inheritance chance, and assume their genetic inheritance follows the same mechanism, for ease and my sanity. So now we only need to figure out the mechanism of inheritance for these boys, plus figure out how sex determination works in all this, and have a think about why attractive and ugly have different inheritance chances, and what the opposite of dwarf actually means here. Now in the real world, most of these remaining traits are overwhelmingly the result of environmental factors, in addition to a plethora of genetic contributors, interactions between genes and interactions between genes and the environment. What these complex systems do is make it hard to give any sort of inheritance chance to most traits that aren't Mendelian, as opposed to the inheritance chance of a specific gene. For example, breast cancer can be caused by a huge number of reasons, but if someone has one of the many BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene mutations, they then have between a 45 and a 65% chance of developing breast cancer by the age of 70. 
However, less than 10% of breast cancer patients have one of these mutations. If we pretend breast cancer is a trait in the CK2 sense, we could say that for an offspring of a mother who has this trait, the offspring may have between a 2.25 and a 65% chance of developing the breast cancer trait by the age of 70 due to the likelihood of the mother having the mutation and then also of the child inheriting it. But if we say the mother does have one of these BRCA mutations, then half of the offspring will have the mutation, then of that 50%, between 45 and 65% will develop breast cancer, giving a 22.5 to 32.5% chance from a parent heterozygous for this mutation. Or, all the offspring will have the mutation, and then we have the standard 45 to 65% chance from a parent homozygous for this mutation. So all we have here is a trait that has a well-understood genetic component that still has an uncertain outcome. And additionally, this genetic component does not account for most, or in fact much, of the reason this trait exists. However, in CK2, the inheritance of a trait is exactly the same, regardless of environment or any other gene interactions. Almost. Meaning we can say that in Crusader Kings 2, genetic variation accounts for effectively 100% of phenotypic variation for all of these genetic traits, which is of course absurd. But enough chit chat about why this doesn't work or make any sense at all, let's lay out the parameters for genetic inheritance in CK2 and make up some ways these inheritance groups we made earlier could work. 1. Constant inheritance chance. 2 sex determination exists. 3. Reproduction is sexual. 4. Genetic traits all have 100% penetrance. 5. Genetic traits all have 100% expressivity. 6. Genetic traits all have a heritability effectively of 1 for all populations at all times. 7. Traits are almost equally likely to be inherited from either parent regardless of sex. 8. Some apparent allelism. 9. Some apparent pseudoepistasis. 10. No pleiotropic genes apparent. Sort of. 11. Somatic mutations do not form mosaic organisms, but instead proliferate throughout the organism, including into the germline. 12. Horizontal gene transfer is possible and can be epidemic. 13. Individuals with a trait are less likely to pass it on to offspring than not. Now this is a wild list. It means the CK2 characters are not like any other organism on Earth, or anything even remotely approaching real genetics. But let's see what we can do to figure this all out. Now number two, there is some sex determination. So there's an event chain in CK2 where a mother can personally breastfeed her offspring. And this results in, amongst other things, a reduction in fertility. In real life, breastfeeding results in a massive reduction in human fertility. This is due to how human sex determination and sexual traits are controlled hormonally, with a little gene kickstarter. So I think it's probably reasonable to say that sex determination is the same in the game as in real human people lives. This also covers number three, but everything from here gets a bit haywire. For number seven, Neither sex chromosome carries any trait-causing genes. Numbers 4 and 8 together tell us that trait alleles for the genes that have them are mutually exclusive, and there can be no double-ups, implying that apart from the sex chromosomes there are no other pairs of chromosomes. Number 10 tells us that each gene that produces a trait is highly specific and does not have some general function even though each trait-causing gene does result in a number of phenotypic outcomes Based on all the other evidence and the static and cumulative nature of these phenotypic outcomes, it may be fair to say that it's not true pleiotropy, but instead how phenotypic outcomes are recorded by the game. This in conjunction with numbers 5 and 6 shows that traits are completely genetically determined and do not interact with each other, except in so much as they can be mutually exclusive. Number 9 relates to the latest genetic trait being introduced overriding any former opposite trait, even beyond the replacement of alleles. This is why we can have opposite traits like dwarf and giant while both being genetically distinct. Based on the inheritance chance and what I've called temporal dominance leads into 11 and 12 which tell us that trait-causing genes introduced into the genome 
through mutations or as syphilis become heritable immediately, implying either CK2 characters are a single cell or the newest introduction to the genome is proliferated throughout all cells through some sort of internal horizontal gene transfer. 13 tells us that even though there aren't pairs of chromosomes, each trait causing gene must have at least two versions. And finally, number one, constant trait inheritance chance, further indicating no genic interactions, while the preclusion of homozygosity further implies no pairing of chromosomes, barring the non-trait causing sex chromosomes, which is supported by the lack of recombination. Either Crusader King's two characters are all male Drosophila with a nutty grouping of inversions and mutations in a bizarre hypothetical neutral environment that can somehow reproduce with each other, or they are sexually reproducing pseudoprokaryotes that can have multiple copies of individual genes all on a single chromosome with non-independent genic assortment mostly and a single pair of sex chromosomes. This is the only possible explanation. We've discovered a new domain of life. So let's finally get around to determining how these traits may actually be inherited. And I propose that each gene must have multiple copies, but only one version of the gene is expressed. And if that version is a trait carrier, then it will always be the one that is expressed. The way I think this can be achieved is through some interesting genomic architecture, nonsense, and wacky reproductive mechanisms. Let's start by figuring out a way that the sequential checks could be biologically happening. We know that in CK2 the pregnant trait appears seven months before birth. Maybe that's reflective of when medieval societies could easily tell someone was pregnant, but that's just too easy. What's actually going on here is CK2 gestation takes seven months, and there is a two month period post copulation where some fancy stuff happens. Presumably CK2 fallopian tubes have modified reservoirs that both store sperm and also restrict the final number of cells that can achieve fertilization. In humans, the journey our little swimmers go on has a purpose, which is of weeding out sperm cells with odd morphology or reduced swimming capacity. In CK2, the only possible thing that makes sense is that this journey is even more arduous, resulting in usually only one sperm cell making it all the way. The limiting factor in amount of offspring is sperm number rather than egg number. One must assume that all eggs are available for fertilization, but because so few sperm make it, only one is fertilized, or on occasion two. Again, it's the only possible explanation. In this scenario, oocytes release some sort of DNA binding protein that enters the sperm cell, likely one of the many zona pellucida proteins. This protein, let's call it pre-ovum organizer protein, or poop for short, converts heterochromatin to euchromatin and reads the genetic information in the sperm cell interacting with the genomic architecture to define sites where DNA should be cut. Simultaneously, it heavily upregulates transcription of itself using the sperm's genome, the product of which interacts with the DNA-bound poops and is modified into masculine yield pre-ovum organizer proteins that are exported to the oocyte and binds to the maternal DNA, similarly defining cut sites. Meiosis resumes in the oocyte and it matures into an ovum due to the action of my poops arriving from the sperm. And the DNA from the two gametes is cut in preparation of unifying into a zygote. Again, I must stress that this is the only possible explanation. While this is some fantastically realistic and very plausible and possible and real and good and excellent science, where do we get the different inheritance chances? I suspect there are two processes occurring here a fair chance-based system, and a biased chance-based system. For the left-handed trait with a 25% chance of inheritance, there is simply four copies of the gene repeated one after the other. Poops surround one of these copies at random in the male, and my poop is modified to read the maternal genome to match the sequence from the male. If there is a match, but only one copy matches, this means the poops have randomly defined the trait gene copy to be selected in the male, and both parents have the trait. This will cause my poops to aggregate around the maternal trait copy, making it inaccessible. So the remaining three wild type copies will be selected for and get the offspring back to four copies of the gene. If three or four copies of the sequence are found, it means either the trait gene copy has not been selected in the father but has in the mother, or the mother does not have the trait and it hasn't been selected in the father respectively, in this case the area is too large for efficient aggregation, so random selection similar to what happens in the father occurs. 
In any case, the remaining two or three copies are sourced from the maternal genome from sequences that must be identical. So the total number of copies will always be four, and they will only ever be one trait causing copy. Once more, only possible explanation. Now the bias selection, and this is actually quite easy. Each gene has a number of copies greater than or equal to two, but the chance our poops define the trait causing version as the one to be passed on is reduced by what's going on around the gene, to the exact number given by the CK2 wiki. This is possible through variant histone groups, because the trait causing gene is likely expressed differently to wild type. The histones that are used for compaction in these regions of the genome have to allow for varied transcriptional activity. The downside to non-standard histones here is that generic DNA binding proteins, like poops and my poops, may have reduced binding capacity. This means there are three variant histone structures, one for each of the inheritance chances. It might sound ridiculous. Alternatively, there are just huge numbers of gene repeats that make it all chance-based for the 10% and 5% inheritance chance traits. If this is the case, each gene version doesn't have to have expressional preference and the product outcompetes wild type expression products in one of any number of ways. But this doesn't account for the 15% chance trait and is dumb, unlike anything I have said. Finally, we shall return to the dwarf trait. This ends up being a bit of a doozy. We might think that it should be the same as a left-handed trait because it has a 25% chance of inheritance. Not so. If you remember all that time ago to the heady halcyon days of a few minutes past, its inheritance pattern is very different from other traits. Because we now know how the pre-ovum organizer protein works, it's clear it can't be determining the dwarf trait inheritance, as it functions sequentially, so there must be another protein. I propose some protein activates a restriction enzyme that is always bound around the dwarf gene. This gene is comprised of two repeats. If either one is the dwarf trait variant, the individual will have the dwarf trait. We'll call this activator protein dwarf inheritance chance kinase, which activates some restriction enzyme, which we can call dwarf inheritance chance kinase phosphate induced cutter, which is bound around the dwarf gene. In both gametes, these two repeats are cut and brought together after fertilization. These two dwarf trait strands are joined, and then one of these four repeats is cut, followed by a non-trait carrying version of the gene being created through some system to produce a non-functioning wild type version. So how might this happen? Perhaps some form of somatic hypermutation that functions beyond the immune system, which as we know about our Crusader Kings 2 organisms becomes inheritable? So we can just call it genetic hypermutation, I guess, and it would have to function in a totally different way because it's based on a single gene that has to have some specific function and is therefore unlikely to contain the genomic structures required for somatic hypermutation. All of this is totally and completely irrelevant. All non-trait causing genes we can't know about because there is no phenotype, except the portrait. But as I have already stated, that's just too much work. But I am very willing to assume, like the majority of cellular components, the rest of the genome is maternally inherited, and without looking at the portraits, there is no evidence to the contrary. Now, inheritance of these CK2 traits have all been perfectly and precisely accounted for with no possible alternatives. We have a couple of final things to take a look at, and this includes the inbred trait. Well, our handy wiki table would have us think it works in the same way as our dwarf trait, but no, young traveller, there's more to the story. The game checks the number of unique ancestors between the two parents to determine if the offspring will gain the inbred trait, and this is compounded by the direct inheritance of the trait itself. And the lunatic trait also does the ancestor check, but we don't care about the issues this raises for this video. Oh god. This would suggest there are a number of further non-trait causing genes for which the accumulation of deleterious mutations causes problems resulting in the inbred trait. The issue is, there is an exact cutoff point where a character goes from not being inbred to being inbred, and it can be precisely modelled with this beautiful function that is completely statistically valid. Because of the specificity of this trait, it must be significantly different from the real world. Presumably there is a group of genes, perhaps like an operon, for which a threshold exists when the inbred trait becomes apparent.
Modeling this is very hard for my tiny smooth pea brain, but presumably this threshold is some X point of similarity across the number of inbred trait determiner genes, which likely means two versions of each gene exists, and we may end up having some pseudo-independent assortment across these genes, maybe even with recombination. Oh my god, this rabbit hole just keeps going down, I don't think I have the capacity to reach the bottom. Now we can understand that this determination operon of inbred trait, or do it, as a physical section of the genome, but scientists have studied the mechanisms by which do it does determine the inbred trait for millennia and have so far come up short, so there's little we can do down this route and just trust that it is genetic, is inherited by a ridiculous function, and will all be able to sleep soundly at night. I'm sure a Nobel Prize awaits some incredible future lab that finally cracks this puzzle someday. The last point we need to consider is how some of these traits interact with each other. This is what I earlier referred to, rather vaguely, as pseudo-epistasis. This is the opposite traits that are mutually exclusive. They're not epistatic really, because the presence of one genetically precludes the presence of the other. Now it's easy enough to say that opposite traits with equivalent inheritance chance are alleles, and so not epistatic at all, however if you cast your mind back, you'll remember that a new genetic trait version of a gene replaces the old transcriptionally active version, whatever that is, likely due to genomic architecture. But for those who have been taking notes, and I will be checking, remember attractive and ugly are both inheritable traits but with different inheritance chances that are mutually exclusive. How could this possibly work? And it's another bit of cheap, barely intelligible nonsense, or should I say, fantastically robust science. Very simply, the ugly slash attractive gene functions the same as the other biased selection traits, but the two alleles have variant histone groups, resulting in different inheritance chances. This leaves us with the dwarf and giant traits, and these do not fit quite as easily as ugly and attractive. After all, I had to create, uh, discover, another protein complex that helps with our dilemma here. The giant dwarf trait reader zinc finger DNA binding protein 1, or GDZNF1. There is no joke here, or anywhere else in this video reads the genome and binds to a specific conserved sequence found only in a functioning dwarf trait, or functioning giant trait. Once bound, the protein repeatedly undergoes ubiquitination due to the action of GD ubiquitin, until it is primed for modification. During this polyubiquitination, once the third ubiquitin molecule has been attached, GDZNF2 complexes with GDZNF1, forming the giant dwarf DNA's complex, that upon further ubiquitination is primed with a junk DNA insert ready to make the gene it is attached to a functional wild type. For this to happen, the giant dwarf DNA's complex must receive a signal. This signal comes from the monoubiquitinated GDZNF1 protein, having just bound to the genome. This means that if a subsequent dwarf or giant gene enters the genome, it will activate the functional removal of whichever was first. All of this biological complexity just for the rare instance when a giant and a dwarf have an offspring together and the game assigns both traits to the offspring, but the maternal one, having been checked last, ends up as the only one the offspring has. In the event of a giant and a dwarf producing an offspring, this very easily understandable scenario has a 1.25% chance of happening and was definitely worth taking this much time to explain. But now, we can definitively draw one possible outcome from all of these genetic things we now know about the CK2 genome. And really, the most striking feature of the genome of the CK2 character is just how much of the genome is reserved for determining and controlling the dwarf trait, including the X-type plasmid-like chromosome being almost entirely dwarf-related. This must have been evolutionary vitally important. Goodbye.